Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. And I'm Jeff Fritz. And this is Intermediate ASP.NET Core 1.0. We've covered a number of different topics. Be sure to explore all of the different things going on today in the, this Microsoft Virtual Academy. Right now we're talking about dependency injection. It's a big couple of words, but it really breaks down into something that's easy to understand when you yeah. look at it. You know, there's there's subtleties to dependency injection, but for the most part, the way I like to think about it is I'm going to spend less time uh, newing up something. Uh -huh. I say that I say newing it up. Like as you look through your ASP.NET Core code, you won't find yourself saying new this and new that right. as much. Right, they say new is glue, right? As soon as you say new something, you're hooked into the signature of a constructor for that object. Oh, that's good. I'm going to yeah. use that. Yeah. Go make, for it. Did you make that up? No. All right, we're going to take We're going to We're, we're going to have to thank Steve Smith for that one. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, I like that. New is glue. So dependency injection, and then also they call inversion of control. Yes. Another way of saying, let someone else be responsible for, uh, for creating that. Mm -hmm. And in the past, we would have like factories, yeah. And we, that was an attempt at letting someone else be responsible. We would have mm -hmm. an interface, and then we'd have an I factor, da, 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 and it would make stuff. But really what dependency injection is about is saying, it is my intent to that I need these things. I declare the need for these yes. objects. I need yes. these interfaces. I don't care how I get them. I just need to make sure that by the time I get called, mm -hmm. that they have arrived and that they've been set up. Somebody else take responsibility for creating them and passing them to me. Well said. So let's switch over to my machine here and take a look at a couple of examples of dependency injection, and then we'll try to uh, create something of, our, of sure. our own. Because we just a few moments ago in the previous module did some discussion of middleware. Yes. We'll do another piece of middleware that then uses dependency injection, and we'll see how it affects its behavior. All right. So here, one of the things that we want to point out as we keep coming back to startup. Startup has this I hosting environment that's being passed in on the uh, constructor there. Yeah. Who makes that? Nowhere in this application has someone said var x equals new hosting environment. That's getting handed in by uh, the, uh, the system. The system mm -hmm. has handed me that, right? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that the framework takes care of for you, mm -hmm. and it just arrives for you. For the right. most part, for the intermediate level that you're working with the framework, it's just handed to you. That's right. really Dependency where injections you need to know. baked in yeah. to ASP.NET. So, like if I wanted an iLogger factory here, I would just add it. And I can have this. Uh, this uh, parameter list in this in this in a method or in this case in a constructor, be in whatever order it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, and I can name these whatever I want. It looks at the method signature, yep, and it says, "Wow, you know, he or she wants this and they want that. I I guess I'll have to go and find out if I know how to make one of those." Right, and typically there's some sort of a mapping in dependency injection that says if you're looking for one of these things, this interface hosting environment you're actually going to use one of these concrete objects instead. Mm -hmm. And before, uh, you had mentioned configure services and how configure yep. is different from configure services. Yep. There's a lot happening inside of something as, as innocuous as add MVC, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of services to support the MVC framework that are being configured inside the dependency injection container, all wrapped up in this one little method for us. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in a previous uh, example, during the, uh, the beginner ASP.NET Core 1.0, we made the, uh, just a very simple directory browser. We turned okay. on uh, static files, and then we said add directory browser or use directory browser. Okay. And then we got an error. It blew up. And mm. it said, I'm unable to find HTTP format or something something yeah. while trying to get this other thing. <laughs> and basically, I wanted a directory browser, and it said, well, in order to do that, I'm going to need to be able to make HTML and format HTML. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. started to build this dependency tree. It didn't know. And I needed to then go and add directory browser. And if we hover over that, it says adds the middleware services, right? Yeah. It lets the system know about all of those things that I might need later. All right. So down here in configure, this is what we used in our last little lab. I'm going to remove all this here. This is the stuff that we built last time. This was the little bits of middleware, and we'll just get that back down to its default. Yeah. So that's 
That, that extra exception handling stuff. Right. This is just what you get out of the box when you typically make a file new project. Uh, we've got application builder app, hosting environment, which doesn't look like we even need right there. We could actually build this and see that it builds, and then I could remove that. Do I have an ENV? I do. I needed it right there. See? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I add that back. All right. And again, it's not this name that matters. It's just that, that uh, interface name. Okay? So what we'll do is we're going to make a, uh, a piece of middleware, and you showed us in the middleware discussion how middleware can fundamentally change Yep. You know, the, the can change your page, can change the content. content. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a piece of middleware that's going to uh, create what we're going to call request IDs. We're going to make these up. This is, you, know, you hit it, request one. I yep. hit it, request two. And that's going to give us a number of things to think about because in, in dependency injection, at least in ASP.NET, there's different... Um, I wouldn't say scoping, but there's different life cycles for objects. How long do yeah. objects live? Yeah. When I request one of these objects, is it the same one that's always been around, or do I get a new copy of that object each time? Mm -hmm. So yeah, how long do they stick around for me? Right. And uh, the three in uh, the three kinds of lifetimes in uh, the context of ASP.NET Core, there's a singleton. Mm -hmm. So there's only one of these. Ever. Right. So like yeah. I application builder, like there's only one. Yep. And you can ask for it as many times as you want, but there'll just be one. You're getting a pointer to that object. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's scoped. This yes. is the term that they use in ASP.NET Core. Scoped. And what does that mean? So scoped says within the context of this one request, this one HTTP request, pass the same instance of that concrete object around. So at the first request of that object, you get a new instance of that, but in every subsequent request of for that object mm -hmm. uh, within your classes, as long as it's within the same HTTP request, you'll receive the same instance from the dependency injection container. So let me see if I can explain that another way and see if I got it right. Sure. Let's say I've got a middleware pipeline, pipeline with a lot of different pieces of middleware. Yep. A single call comes in, mm -hmm. runs through that pipeline. Yep. And within that, lots of different people want to use my object, like a log object, for example. Sure, sure. They're going to say, give me a log, give me a log, hey, I need a log. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the same one if it was scoped. Yes. Because it's scoped to that context. Yep. You might also do that with, I guess, a database connection. Yep. You might have a database connection that is uh, a singleton, depending on how your database works. Sure. It might be one database connection per request mm -hmm. or transient. Right, the third option. Which would mean a new one every time you ask. Yes. Okay. Every time you ask for one, it, uh, start a new copy, a, a new instance of that object, and start to pass it in. Okay. So let's see if we can uh, look at requests and just make up a number to assign to requests and how we would do that. So we're going to make a piece of middleware right now, and I'm going to go over into my Solution Explorer. We've got our Controllers folder and our Views folder. I'm going to make one. We'll just call it services. Oops. You're not on. There you it's go. hard to see. There we go. I try to zoom and then I make it so I can't see myself. We're going to add a new class. So these request IDs really are just going to be kind of a number. We'll say request ID. And this is a, again, this is something that we are making up. All right. Right. Simple example just to show that we're, we're counting the requests that are coming into the service. Right. This is not uh, nothing more than what we've made up. We are going to go and say a string ID, and we'll have uh, you can get them. That's basically all they are. Actually, that would be probably an I request ID, I would think. And then um, we're going to want to change that to an interface from a class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I need to make an actual uh, request ID first, actually. So let me let me back up. There's a request ID, right? Or do you think I should make it an, an interface? Start with the interface. Okay. So to be an I request ID, you did that right there. Is that correct? Uh, we need an interface declaration on line eight. Public interface I request ID. There we go. All right, cool. And then. And then we can implement that interface. Sure. Well, and then I could also uh, I could yeah I can implement that interface. Uh, and I found it, let's going to make a uh, a factory of things that is going to go and uh, and make those. So it's a public 
interface i request id factory and this is going to be the thing that'll make them it'll 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 divvy them out right dole them out true uh yeah. make string make request id okay Let's see if we get this right does that look right looks good okay so that's an i request id factory mm -hmm. so then we'll need an actual request id factory derives from i request id factory and then there i can look at that cool implement it implement that right there okay so our request id factory is going to be the thing that makes them right mm -hmm. it's going to divvy them out so each time i ask for it it's going to do something so does it make a new GUID, a new globally unique identifier? That's not no. really as interesting. No, we need, we need an integer that really, you know, allows us to count and see that this request came after that request. Ah, interesting. So by making an integer, having it increase in size, we're going to know that that one came after that one. So then we'll say private int, oops, uh, request ID, okay. So then our make request ID, which by default says, you know, hey, I'm uh, not, not implemented, in. yeah. Uh, we'll have this go and return. And then we're going to take that ID, this request ID here, and I could say, you know, plus plus. But why would that be a problem? Yeah, you know what? It, that's not thread safe. If we're, if we're using a singleton, if we're using one of these other models where uh, the, the scoping where we could have multiple threads requesting access to this at the same time. Mm -hmm. You could end up with collisions there, right. right? Not incrementing it properly, not managing the integer properly. So I think we want to do something a little more thread safe there. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this integer here and we're going to use a thing called interlocked, which is inside of system.threading. And we're going to say, interlocked increment. We're going to go and increment that as an atomic operation. Yep. Okay. And uh, I think we need to make that a reference. Uh -huh, exactly, because you, you don't actually pass in a copy of that right. integer. You're passing a reference to it, so a pointer to that or a reference to that. So we're going to increase that in size and then pass back the, the string. So our factory now, each time you call it, you're going to get one, two, three. All right. And, and to be clear, the interlocked increment is a thread safe way to work with that integer. Mm -hmm. So every, we won't be blocking, we'll be working with it discreetly. Okay. So uh, we've got our I request ID, mm -hmm. and we can go and make a, just like we had one interface and then implemented it, let's say request ID. And this one is going to have an ID, I request ID. It's a capital D. Oh, capital D. There we go. Okay, so then where should it get that from, right? When you want a request ID and you say, hey, request ID dot ID, that should go and get that from uh, the request factory, right? So yeah. this request ID has a constructor. And it's going to need to get a hold of that factory and then take that ID and do something with it, right? Mm -hmm. So then it might uh, have an ID and pass that around somehow. Things are going to start getting a little hairy. This is pretty simple, but you can start to see that there's a little bit of an intertangled yeah, there's, uh, there's bit some, of relationships there. There's dependencies passing back and forth here that would be tricky to new up by themselves. Right. So, like, for example, here in request ID, do I... Make a, re make a request ID factory. What we'll do is we'll try to have it uh, say that it needs one yeah. by putting it into the method signature of the, co of the constructor here. And then I'll squirrel it away. We see this before where we say underscore and something. That's kind of the way to say that uh, this is a private, it's kind of a standard way. We'll say make request ID, which is going to do that, that interlocked increment. So we'll say private uh, or we'll say a read-only string of request ID. Okay, so let's look at this for a second. 
here's an interface that says, here's how we do request IDs. We'll hide that. We've got an actual implementation of request ID that's going to take a factory. I'm not newing anything. Notice I haven't said new anywhere in here. And we're just going to squirrel away that ID. And this is a little bit verbose, saying get and all that. I'm actually going to do a simpler property getter with our Anders operator, or the little hash rocket there. Yeah, the C-sharp 6 feature. Mm -hmm. So when we ask for an ID, give them the private and internal one. OK? Yep. So then the question is, how long do these things live? OK? Um, we haven't said new anywhere in here. We haven't newed anything up. No, these are classes that stand by themselves right now. Uh -huh. But request ID needs a request ID factory. Mm -hmm. So one of those needs to be made or at least handed in to request ID at some point. And request ID factory, how many of those should there be? Yeah, if we're managing the request IDs across all requests coming into the application. You really only want one of these. Okay. So then that would imply that a request ID factory would be a singleton. Okay, there's just one for the whole app shared across the app. Yep. All right. So then request IDs, when someone asks for one, how long should they be? Because I might ask for request IDs multiple times, but I don't know if I necessarily want one request to have its ID change yeah. within the request. Yeah, you're going to want kind of pointers back to the same HTTP request from those various places, whether it's a Razor page, mm -hmm. or it's a piece of middleware, or if it's in the middle of that MVC controller. So we want that to be scoped to the current request. Yeah. So when someone asks for one of those, uh, they are going to get one that the, where, whose its life cycle is, is, uh, is set by ASP.NET Core in the dependency injection system and not by me. Again, I never said new anywhere here. So here's where things get cool. Remember before we were inside of configure services and we talked about how that's where we prepare the pipeline and let them know about all the different services that are available and then later on use them. Let's go in here and say services because this is going to be a collection of service, like the, the ability to make request IDs. Yep is a service now <clears throat> that is available to our application, OK? And we zoom in on here, and we see add scoped, add singleton, and add transient. Those there are the three types that you pointed out, right? OK. So what do we got here? Add singleton. There's two, or there's actually several. There's nine different you know, ways to do this, and you can pass in funks of funk and all kind of cool stuff. Yeah. I like to keep it a little simple because I'm not too clever. And I'll say, I request ID factory. Notice how it's not popping up. It's because it's missing my namespace services. Mm -hmm. So I can click on that. Getting some help from Visual Studio there with yep. the. I can click on the little light bulb there, but I like to go and hit Control dot yeah. Enter. And that actually added it. And I know it worked because it turned color. Yep. That control dot is so helpful as yeah, you're going through and writing code. Control dot and control comma are the two things I use the most. Control comma lets me do quick navigation. So if I'm going to go control comma and then say request ID and then go right to it or control comma, configure services, and we're right back there. A real quick way to navigate. Those two. Now, now, when you create that singleton there with the add singleton statement, you've defined here's the signature that if somebody requests this mm -hmm, type, mm -hmm. you also need to specify the concrete type there. So this is the thing I want. When yep. I need I request factories, who's the one that's going to handle it? If we zoom in there, it says, OK, cool. What's the service? Mm -hmm. I request factory, thing that makes requests. Yep. And what is the implementation? As you said, the concrete. Yeah. Implementation of that. Excellent. So we'll say that is, and that's a type name, OK? Mm -hmm. Request ID factory. So this says, hey, ASP.NET Core, anytime anybody comes around asking for request ID factory, this will be the one that handles it. Yep. And they don't have to be named the same. This could be called 
superfoo factory, it doesn't matter, as long as it is a thing that implements I request factory. All right. So then we want to say add scoped. Yeah. So request IDs themselves mm -hmm. don't last too long, but just the right amount. All right. So those services are now in the same collection of services the, that uh, that MVC is. Now, if we talk about <clears throat> the method signatures there on lines 34 and 35, mm -hmm. you're passing in type names for those concrete implementations. Right. So when the framework goes to create those, right, mm -hmm. the singleton request ID factory, it's going to look for a method, a constructor signature that it knows how to complete. Now, our request ID factory didn't have a constructor that had parameters that it needed to go figure out how to create. Ah. So it knows how to new that up. So when it goes to create that singleton, it'll create a new and it'll stash it with that signature that we're using. I see. So you're saying that this is a really easy class for it to make yep. because it has itself no dependencies. No dependencies. But when it goes to create the request ID, it's going to the first time that it's requested, it's going to request a new request ID and go figure out those constructors. Oh, I need an I request ID factory. Go resolve, get that singleton, and insert it in, and then pass you the fully instantiated. So, so that implies that I need to make sure that all of the different services that I could potentially need are, are added. Yes. And if you do a callback to many, many hours ago when Maria and I were doing our directory browser, we saw where we, we said use directory browser, and then it said, I was trying to make a directory browser, but I came upon this thing downstream somewhere called HTML formatter. Yeah. I got stuck. That needed to be in the, uh, in the list of, in that service collection. And in fact, we could probably put a breakpoint there and look at the collection as well if we wanted to see all the different things in there. So uh, quick for the viewers, that, that pop-up window that you showed yeah, us there, what's the hotkey to bring that up? That is Alt F12. So I like to go and say go to definition. This is peak definition. So I'm in this tab and I'm looking at a request ID and I'm thinking about request IDs. I can go and say peak. There it is. And I get a window within a window. And what's cool about that is that it, it's real. Like I can look around there. Yeah. So this is a really nice way for us to see that request IDs need request ID factories and how that chain of dependency works. There good. you go. Good observation and a good thing to point out. All right, so that's interesting, but th those are just two uh, POCOs or plain yeah. old CLR objects that are out there in the world. We don't actually have any middleware to do anything with them. Right, they're just living out there. Nobody's creating or requesting them yet. That's a good point. Even though we've added it to the services collection, it's not going to ever be made because yeah. no one ever needed one. No, nobody's instantiating it. All right. So let's go over here. And these folders really are just convention. It's up to you how you want to name your folders. But having one for services is nice, mm -hmm. as is having one for middleware. Yeah. OK. So middleware, this is going to be like your custom middleware. It's mm -hmm. going to sit in the pipeline, and it's going to do stuff. It's going to use these different services. So I'm going to say add new class, and we'll make a request ID middleware. All right, and this request ID middleware is going to have a constructor that is going to be just like yours. When we make some middleware, you're going to need to have a few things passed in. First, there is a request delegate, delegate. That all comes out of AS, uh, HTTP uh, namespace inside of ASP.NET Core. So you need the next one, yep. right? Now, we want a new request ID in our middleware because we're doing stuff with request IDs. So we're going to need that namespace as well. I think it's a capital D. Oh, and there we go. Fixed it. Fixed it and added it using it at the same time because I'm fancy. Nice. Yes. Uh, then let's have a logger as well because why not? Like we have all these things available to us. Why not have it log things? That's cool. Uh, and we'll say we need an iLogger that knows about request ID middlewares. We'll name it logger. So we're able to start this class up, and we've already got a whole bunch of stuff available to us, and we didn't have to new anything. No, we didn't. It's just going to be passed in. 
and create it as needed with the scopes that are defined mm -hmm. inside that configure method. Exactly. Configure services method. Exactly. So because our invoke is going to need to hang on to next, the next uh, bit of middleware, we'll just take a moment and we will uh, squirrel away the next delegate. That's going to hang on to what comes next in the pipeline. And then we're going to go and take our logger. And since we got one passed in, we're going to want to uh, hang on to it so we can use it for the life of our object. And that is going to be request ID middleware. And that one was called underscore logger. And what we're going to do is in this next is passed here and logger is passed there. It's next equals next and logger equals logger. I think there's ways to make that a little cleaner, but for now, I think that'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Then remember what a middleware has to have. Has to have that invoke method, Scott. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing it has to have. That's a, it's almost an interface without an interface. It is. It's an agreement that they know how to be invoked. And as you pointed out, in the middleware section, they get passed in the HTTP context. Yep. And we're going to also have it get a request ID. It's so painful to watch someone else type, isn't it, Jeff? You're, um, you're, you're being very kind. I'm, um, yeah. <laughs> Somebody know, once said this is what it's like watching your manager type. Oh, <laughs> that's so painful. You know, I type uh, 100 words a minute, but it's 90 of it is errors. Oh. Yeah, it's mostly backspace. I IntelliSense 90 words a minute. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a good point. IntelliSense should count towards your ultimate typing speed, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So we're going to go and say logger, and we talked about this during diagnostics and logging section. Yeah? Yeah, look at all those log Methods. Yeah, exactly. And this is going to follow the, we saw how we could go and configure your logging and say, only show me critical mm -hmm. or only show me warnings and above. Yeah. We're going to yeah. say, go into the log information. This is going to have an informational thing. And then we're going to use our favorite thing in the world, which is string interpolation. We'll say, this is request. And then we'll say request ID. I love getting IntelliSense inside of a C sharp string. It still seems impossible. I. This feature has completely changed the way I type strings in yeah, C Sharp. It's good. So there we go. Request right now is executing. This one's squiggling because it feels like something is not happening. We never we haven't returned anything. Return the next exactly. So we'll say next, and we'll pass our context. So all we're going to do in this thing is invoke. But you know what I'm realizing? Once again. We went an entire class without knowing anything. Yeah. We simply yep. said we need a request ID. And here's another interesting thing. I don't see anything about a request factory here. Right. Yeah. We didn't even have to worry about that, did we? Because the request ID factory was the thing that handled that. So we have a little bit of a single responsibility principle. Yep. And notice yep. also we asked for a request ID right here. But we never made a request ID factory. That gets made for us. Exactly. So no one that we know of or see makes a request ID factory or visibly calls make request ID. It's all being hidden from us. It's middleware for the middleware. Hmm. Yeah, we did actually make some, some middleware services strange. for our middleware. That's a good point. So there's a couple of things that we can do here. We can go and add this request ID middleware. Remember our namespace that it's in by going into startup, okay? And we've got our list of kind of existing middleware. Yep. I think that that probably seems like a good spot. Yeah. You did a thing that was cool. You said use, and you had, you know, Jeff's awesome middleware or whatever. You had a use method. You could have just stopped at use Jeff's awesome. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty true. good. Yeah. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a more generic one so I don't write that yeah. sugar. I'm sure. going to say use middleware. And then I'm going to say request ID middleware. And you see it's not able to find that because it's in the middleware namespace. It went and fixed my spelling error as well, which is pretty cool. All right. So I could go and make a helper function, use request ID middleware. Sure could. Which is yeah. cool. It oh, gives yeah. you IntelliSense and it's, it's friendly. But if I don't want to do that, I don't have to do that. I can right. go and just do it like this. If I don't want to make that uh, 
that little bit of sugar that you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that looks good. So let's go and uh, make sure that we're running this. I'm going to do it under Kestrel because I like to see my messages at the uh, at the command prompt there, the DOS box, and we'll run this application and check it out. Do we still call it the DOS box, or do we now call it the shell window? Ah, it's the command prompt. I yeah. mean, there's there's PowerShell, there's Bash, there's there's the you know. I made it green to make it look like an Apple II, so you know ultimately I can't win. Reminds me of a 3270. It's good. That just means that you're old. Oh. So so check this out. Look, request two, request three. We could actually go in and see how many requests get called. You know, so why don't we try this? Okay, what do you got? So we, we put in that this is set on a scoped request, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't we add a, why don't we inject the request ID into the view that you're showing there? All right. Oh, wait, that's not a view, is it? No, it is. Okay, why, why, why don't, don't we inject it into the view? Why don't you show me how to do that? Okay, so what we do is we add a new um, directive there after model. It okay. is um, at inject, lowercase, okay. and then space. And then it it's almost follows the syntax as though we were declaring a variable. So you specify the type that you're looking for. Uh, the type in this case was a request you're ID. You're looking for an I request ID. And I think it was in web application 22 middleware. Uh, not, is it in middleware? Well, is it? In, oh, you're right. It's Pardon in me. It's in services. Thank you. It is in services. And All then right. you, and then after that, you need to specify the name of the variable that you're going to be receiving. Let's say just rec. Sure. Okay. So now let's output that rec ID a little bit further down there. So at rec. It uh, can't be that easy. Is, isn't there a property on there we need to? Yep, .id. You're yeah, right. there we go. But still, it, it can't be that easy. It can't be, but it is. Are you sure? You're freaking me out now. Let's find out. It's like we planned this. <laughs> it's almost like this is a script, Jeff. <sighs> Request ID The two. irony, of course, is that there's no script. Now, so you're seeing request ID did you notice one? That, did you want to notice something funny? Let's do that again. People might be wondering because it skipped a number. It did. You know why? Look, there's two. And there's three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it requesting C? Oh, no, fav icon, Ico, is ah, in there. See it requesting? Yeah, where is that? Show me. Uh, third line from the bottom inside that. There it is. Yeah, Request see that? starting. The favorite icon. The favico, that's the little icon that goes up there. Yep. That is a request. And because this is really, really important to remember, because middleware is as much a handler as is it a module, it's listening to everything. Every request for every file. So I would need to change that to say, well, I only care about pages or I only care about right. images or whatever. It's right. up to it's up to uh, up to us. So you could change where that middleware is called so that it occurs after transmitting those static files. Mm -hmm. And then it won't affect, it won't trigger when those static files are being transmitted. Exactly. Right here, I'm just holding down Control R. Uh, this is my poor man's load test. Oh, there you go. But it's an interesting point, though, because it does also bring up to that issue of the original reason that we went and did this the way we did is that you might very well have people doing stuff simultaneously. And you need to make sure that you don't have any threading issues. So we did a very, very simple bit of. Uh, of business there to go and say interlocked increment and go in ID plus plus yep. on that particular item. All right. So that is, I think, a pretty visceral way to look at dependency injection. I think the only thing that wasn't discussed there would have been transient. Here's a question. Could we for lack of a better word, break this or do it do it wrong if we changed the way we registered these services. Absolutely. Why don't why don't we do that real quick? So when you create when you added the request factory as a singleton, okay. let's change that to add transient. Oh, it's probably going to break something. Add yeah, transient. So what is a transient? It doesn't. So transient says every time that one of these is requested, I'm going to create a new instance. Okay. So a new instance of the factory. A new instance of the factory. Okay. 
So we haven't actually changed, this is important, we haven't actually changed the implementation of the, uh, of the request ID. We, so didn't change the, we didn't change any of the request ID or request factory related code. Correct, okay. right. But now take a look at our log in our output HTML. Oh, look at that. It's, it's request, everything is request one. Right, because each time that it requests the factory, it's getting a brand new instance of the factory. Interesting. Okay. So what if we change the factory from transient to scoped? So at least it would be the same per request, sure. but every request would get their own. Right. So you get the same thing. Me. Right. Mm. So if you were requesting that middleware several different times within the scope of that controller, you might see that number increment. I see. So if we put it in multiple places in subviews and different locations within our application, at least the number would remain the same. Yep. But because the factory is not a singleton, it would always be one. Yep. All right. So scoping is so important and such a fundamental aspect of it this. Is. It's also worth pointing out that while dependency injection is kind of baked into ASP.NET Core, uh, you don't have to do anything to make it happen. No. You have to turn anything on. It's yeah. there by default. It, uh, you don't have to use it if you don't want to. Exactly. And you could new things up all you wanted, but absolutely. eventually it'll, it'll probably hurt. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a good development practice yeah. to use this. But it's important to note also that there are great third-party dependency injection systems out there. Yes. You know, you can check out AutoFAC. There's different injections. So if you like this style, mm -hmm. that's great. But if you have a preference for another system, like a third-party one, like I use AutoFAC as an example, be sure to explore those as oh, yeah. well. Because some people like to declare these things in different ways. Absolutely. And you, you pointed out that it is used throughout the framework. Every class that the framework creates is eligible to be connected to with dependency injection, mm -hmm. set up the constructor parameters, and those will be passed into you, as well as the views. The views, that's really the new one that we never really had before in older versions of ASP.NET. Injecting things into the views, while cool, might not be applicable in every scenario. It Very might cool. be better to pass them as models. All right, so that is a general sense of a dependency injection and how it works in ASP.NET Core. We'll take a short break and we'll come back and talk about Web APIs. Oh, fantastic.